Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and today I'm delighted to be joined on the Axon Bulletin by two of our regular contributors. We have Laura Bradburn rejoining us, and after about a three week absence, Jim Orr is back in the hot seat. Welcome back to the show, guys. Hi there. Afternoon, Paul. Good to be back. It's good to see you, Jim. Uh, we will be getting your kind of update over the last seven days um, as a Celtic supporter. I'll come to yourself first, Laura. How's the last seven days been for you? What's your kind of takeaways from the world of Celtic? Well, I was just talking to you before we came on air and I said, it's only a week since I was last on and it feels like a million years. I mean, like, I've, I've been watching the show every every day this week on, on my lunch break and... Uh, I know that we've gone over it ad nauseum, but I mean, I, I I just feel a little bit like, you know, I saw one of the guys earlier on in the week describe us as descending into our kind of banter years, and that is definitely the way that it feels. You know, we we, as we should, we've delighted in the in the the trials and tribulations of certain other clubs and certain other teams at times. I, I think we would be extremely hypocritical if we didn't except that this was going to come both battles from all sides. Um, I think that the Dubai situation, I, the Dubai situation to me, I, I've listened to everybody's points on it and, and I accept what people are saying. The one aspect of it that I do disagree with is a lot of people seem to be framing it in the context of us being 19 points behind, of us playing terribly, of us potentially losing the 10 and even, you know, having a problem with football players having a beer. I, I don't have an issue with, with football players having a beer. Although I do have an issue with us being 19 points behind, that for me is not the context in which the, the Dubai trip has wound people up. We've gone over it before, but to do that in the middle of a global pandemic, to put yourselves, other people at risk, to put the, the integrity of the league at risk by potentially coming back and having to isolate if you contract anything while you're over there, it's just shocking. It's just an embarrassment, and it, it's something that I think, quite rightly, we've been we've been uh, criticised from all sides for, and 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 I'm I'm no different to it, basically. Jim, when you see these things happen, uh, I mean, I've called it a PR disaster. Uh, you know what Laura says there: footballers having a a pint of lager or whatever it might be the day after a big game when they know that they've got a break. You know, in isolation, that's not a big deal, but. Under the you know current circumstances, Laura uh, describes the situation pretty well. They're saying that you know the context of this, it's all wrong, and you know Celtic have basically dealt with it by you know tweeting out loads of pictures of the team training really hard. So hopefully they come back refreshed. What's your thoughts been on it, Jim? I would certainly echo Laura's sentiments there. But uh, as I said a number of times on the podcast, this was meant to be the season of doing the ten. So don't do anything that puts that at risk. Don't do anything that does that. And I've said in the past, when we're playing games in Europe, don't send my best players because they might catch COVID. And what this club has decided to do is take the whole squad out of the country. It's an idiotic decision. And whatever happens after that, the consequences of that, I don't care. It's all down the club. It was an idiotic decision to do that. And whatever comes their way, they totally deserve. And if we have to forfeit games because somebody has to isolate, that's down to the that's that's down to Celtic. That's down to the club. That's whoever made that decision. And it doesn't matter if you get it agreed by the Scottish government or the SAFA. It was an idiotic idea in this season. This season, you don't do stupid things. And game after game, month after month, week after week, the level of decision making at the club has been appalling. And we are where we are because of them. And I've got three weeks worth of ranting to get through. So how long do we have today? <laughs> Plenty of time, Jim. Plenty of time. You've got some marvellous guests on your on your, on your podcast, Paul. And although Kevin Graham is the the king of the analogies, the best analogy that's came for, is actually came for Lauren when he said this week or last week or something that if you replace the manager, it's like replacing the front door and your house is crumbling. And that's what we've got. We've got a club that's just crumbling. So changing the manager, although that would be good, won't make that much of a difference. And the king of the analogies actually came up with actually the best point of the week was that uh, despite nine years of success, we're doing that in actual uh, in spite of the guys who run the club. Because just think where we would be if we people who ran the club who had some sort of plan, 
some sort of strategy. Mm. We'll be in a far better position to where we are just now. I don't have any great issue with losing the league this year because the team across the city are actually doing really, really well. And even if we were putting at the best of our, our powers, we might not still be top of the league. Uh, but how this season is, is starting to pan out, even though we're miles behind, it's, it's kind of like the 90s again. A wee bit, a lot of people described the game last week, like back in the 90s. I know a lot is too young to remember the 90s. The games where we, we would tend to dominate the game, do something daft, and end up losing the game. And if you look at this season, and look at the points that have been dropped, we do drop points by drawing with uh, four, four teams. And of the four teams that we drew, we dropped points at Rugby Park, Petroji mm-hmm. and Easter Road. Any other season you would expect us to, to drop points there. So, so, so fair enough, you can't win them all. The points dropped against St Johnson, unforgivable. And across the city, they, they've dropped points at Easter Road, which you would tend to do, and, and, and at Livingston, which is unusual. So this season, actually, so far, if, if we win more games in hand and I, and I take all those points on board, we don't actually look like it doing it. But if we did win those games in hand, it's down to 10 points. And then that was down to the two Derby's games. If we'd have won the two Derby games, we'd be two points ahead. And, and this is a kind of throwback to the 90s for me. I don't think we deserve to win the league this year. I don't have an issue with us not winning the league. And I would say hats off to the team who won the league because they've done things that we haven't done. I don't know if you've seen the, the tweet by the guy calling himself Duco James, who does the Celtic uh, huddle breakdown. Yeah, yeah. He, he retweeted something that he, that he tweeted after the finished Varus game, and it was Nostradamus-like. And actually, everything that's happened, he had it on that tweet. Mm. Uh, and if you time at some point later in the podcast, I've got it sitting here, and I could read you some bits and pieces from that, but, but I'll leave that for now. Dubai, that's all in the club. All on the club. You know, when you're talking about the analogy of, you know, Neil Lennon being part of a much bigger problem, Jim, um, there has been comments today actually coming out in the press. Um, again, try to be positive yesterday and it's just it's difficult sometimes when you're, you're reacting to the topical points that Celtic uh, are involved in. But we will talk about some transfer news at some point. Um, and the point was made that, uh, well, the question was raised in relation to the CEO, the CEO of Celtic. Um, and I thought there was an excellent point yesterday, Jim, going back to what you said before, some of the points that are made, not just by the pundits, of course, but by the, the, the great number of people who get involved in the comments and in the chat and it was all down to and it made perfect sense actually it it seems obvious but and it certainly did make perfect sense if Peter Lowell is looking to step down at the end of the season then you know it wouldn't be in Celtic's best interest if they want to get the best replacement CEO to have a different manager in place because you would guess that the CEO wants to be involved in that decision making process should a new one be coming in um, Laura I, I took that yesterday and thought well you know that actually makes a lot of sense because we, we do feel as though the board have been sitting on their hands a lot of the time um, they th- they're kind of praying for Rangers to collapse as Jim said before it doesn't look likely do you think that may be where we are in terms of why Neil Lennon's still in position well, I think certainly um, that for Peter Lowell, Neil Lennon is a preferred choice where he, w- he probably wouldn't be for a number of other people in the same position. You know, I think there's a, a previous relationship there that has been uh, used to justify Lennon's uh, reappointment, certainly, uh, to the club when, when he did get reappointed after Rogers left. Uh, so from that point of view... You could look at it two ways. Either a, a new C- CEO is going to come in and say, don't want to rock the boat too much, want to assess the situation, or he's going to come in with ideas uh, of how to take the club forward and thinks that a particular person uh, will help to facilitate that. It's not It's not an uncommon step to take, to be honest. We've all seen it before where um, managers immediately... Um, fear for their jobs when a a new chairman or a new owner or a new uh, higher up at the club comes in. So I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I I think Neil Lennon's days are numbered as it is, whether Peter Lowell stays or whether he goes. But um, certainly if somebody comes in to replace Lowell, I would think that the the logical next step would be to to replace him with somebody that the the CEO has either worked with before or knows will, will carry out, you know, some of the 
some of the plans that he has in place. And I, I get that that sort of flies in the face of what we've said before. We've, we've talked about Lowell maybe being too involved in the football side of things, but at the end of the day, there does have to be a cohesion between a CEO and and everybody else at the club. And that includes probably the second most important person at the club or the most important person at the club who's the manager. So I, I would I would certainly think any change in the structure higher up in the club is going to be followed by a, certainly a change in the management team and possibly the coaching team as well because I would like to think that any manager coming in would be able to bring in their own staff unlike what's happened this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it all flows and I think that's what we're getting back to when, you know, Jim, you were on the show a few weeks ago and we were talking about the protests, we were talking about some of the banners um, disband the PLC, I think one of the banners was at that time. Um, I do think that, you know, there does that there is a, a restructure required. There's there's members of that board who are almost faceless entities. They're just, you know, they're blazers who don't seem to have a voice. They don't seem to, to get involved in any of the decision-making process. And, you know, there have been, in the past, there have been very strong Celtic chairmen. I don't think we have a, a strong Celtic chairman at the moment. Do you think this is going to happen, a full restructure, that, that some of the, the big decision makers at the very top of the club um, will be uh, moving on at the end of this season? Do you think that was always a plan? I think we're in total limbo at the moment. I have no idea what's actually going to happen just now. You stand or fall by the decisions that you make and decisions have to align to some sort of strategy somewhere. I've got no idea what the strategy is. The last few days, you've been accused of being quite, of being quite negative. You're actually a very upbeat, positive person, I think, to the to the point that I think you still think that Peter Law is going to come on your podcast because you've got high expectations. I don't think that's going to happen because I don't think he would a, want to come on. If he did come on, I think he would, he would obviously vet the questions and I think the answers that he would give you would be unsatisfactory. So I, I'd love him to be honest. I'd love him to go on the podcast and say, you know what? We have got no strategy at all. We have got no plans. We have no idea what we're doing. No idea at all. Right? Because that's like to me. No strategy, no plans. We're making this up on the roof. Right? Tomorrow's a new day. What's going to happen? We have no idea. No idea at all. Let's just see what happens. How do you hire a manager? Let's look in the showers. Let's see if we can find in the showers. Who's got some shampoos and do you want the job? You can have the job. Oh, we need to ask you a question first. Do you know how you get from Sucky Hall Street to Aikenhead Road? Yeah, I do. You've got the job. You know the job. <laughs> That's what's important. If you've got shampoo and conditioner and a street map of Glasgow, you've got the job. That's the strategy. That's your strategy. How 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 mad is that? As I've said before, McDonald, uh, if they were going to hire a uh, lowest pay employee, they would advertise the post. Mm. They would have a shortlist, they would interview people. Nah. Shower, shampoo, A to Z of Glasgow, you've got the job, mate. You've got the job. So next manager, shower, A to Z of Glasgow, you've got the job. So let's go out for that. My expectations are very low. And they meet my expectations every single time. You know this, Jim? <clears throat> I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up because um, when was it now? I think it was after the Dubai pictures emerged, Laura. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, just... Uh, I, I get that a lot of people are very, very emotional at this moment in time when it comes to our club. So every single thing you say is uh, you're putting yourself up for criticism and that's fine because you, you take that when you when you, you come on the show. But I said that the picture of Neil Lennon and Scott Brown by the poolside um, typified everything about Celtic this season and maybe even uh, wider than this season because I said it was far arrogant and lazy, right? Now, going back to Jim's point about appointing Neil Lennon in the showers, and part of that was the fact that there's a drawer somewhere in Peter Lowell's office with all these CVs and applications uh, that he's not bothered to look at. I don't believe that. I actually don't. I think this falls into this arrogant part of my comment at the beginning of this week, whereby that was just aloofness by Peter Lowell to come away and say that. Maybe my expectations are too high, Jim, in me saying this, but I think at the, the level that Celtic are operating at in terms of a football club as a business, 
not to even look at CVs, not to consider applications as gross negligence. And I actually, to give them some credit, I just feel as though he was being very aloof in saying that. And also, I also believe that the reason he did it was to give Neil Lennon the belief um, that he had the full backing at all times and the board weren't yeah. looking to consider other managerial prospects. So, so then, Paul, what would, a, what would a sensible person do? Because I think it's a lack of awareness, right? What a sensible person would have done at that moment would have to say, Neil's won is the, uh, uh, the cup. That's the treble, treble done. We owe Neil, you know, a lot here. We've got a number of applications. We're going to sift through the applications in the next few weeks or so. And Neil's done himself no harm today. He's a real candidate for the job. And give it a week. And for all we know, the level of candidates might be really poor. And Neil might have got the job anyway. But at least when you do that, you say, well, we've thought about this. I think there's a complete lack of awareness to have done that. And I've said to you before, because you write books, words are very important. And when you say something, people are going to hone in on that stuff. The word that you've loved this year has been culture. You haven't mm. let that go. Right so my new word is values. Last time was when we were talking about values. So when you say something, as you said a minute ago, people are going to pick you up. I can't see the comments, but I'm sure there are lots of comments will be saying, what's this guy talking about? He's an idiot. Fine, right. But if you say something, as you said a minute ago, people will comment on that. And if you're running a large football club and you're earning three and a half million pounds, I think at the very least you should watch what you say mm -hmm. because it may come back to it. And I think we're a very risk-averse club. So you don't take chances and you don't take risks. The Dubai is a perfect example of a huge risk. Why would you do mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. this season? Of so I don't have a lot of sympathy. I think if you're paying people big bucks, then you stand and fall by decisions that you make. And if and if and and if you if you say things, you have to stand by them. You have to justify them. And that was a ridiculous thing to say. And I think fans are quite entitled to keep repeating that. Mm -hmm. Why did you do that? What was all that about? Because all it does is it's treat yourself in the foot. Is it more difficult for you in the future moving forward? Because that will always be around your neck. I think it's a total lack of awareness. Now, I wouldn't want to waste too much energy in talking about Dubai. I think. When you see the players doing some of the things they're doing, that's a lack of awareness as well. Yeah. Surely they should have been told, if you're going to Dubai, you know, I understand you're working hard and it's really hot and you can have a couple of beers, but stay out of sight. Don't give people an excuse to make this a bigger disaster than it is. Don't make it an excuse for us to have to rank up the PR machine to make it better because this all comes back to whoever made that decision to go to Dubai should be sacked. <laughs> you know, because it endures 10 in a row. And the points Laura made earlier... There's other issues as well. People could come back ill. Mm. Now, uh, what the kind of headline is, is, should Eddie stay? Now, some of the issues Eddie's had this year is because he caught COVID. And yeah. who knows <clears throat> what impact that had. And I'm sure we all know people who have who've caught this, who it's lasted months and months and months and they've never recovered. Mm -hmm. You know, so, anyway. No, you're right. Line. You're I, right. I, I, think, I, think what, I think what Jim's saying is, <clears throat> is, is hit the nail on the head. I've seen the phrase banded about a lot this week in relation to a lot of things. Uh, the phrase "read the room." It's it's not it's not about the legalities of certain things. It's not about whether, on a technical level, you are entirely correct to do what you're doing. It's about looking at the reaction that it might cause. It's about looking yeah. at looking how people might perceive what you're doing. Peter Lawwell, when he made the announcement about Neil Lennon, I think you're exactly right. I think he thought, if I say we didn't need to look at anybody else, then that will make the Celtic fans sure that we are supportive of Neil Lennon. It will make Neil Lennon sure that we are supportive of him as a manager. Actually, what it did was made us look very unprofessional as a football club. Um, I think that even, even the response in Dubai of the PR team, the use or the overuse or the abuse, whatever you want to call it, of, of Turnbull and Sorrow on the social medias kind of speaks to the level of or the lack of depth with which the PR teams are, are thinking about what they're doing. They don't see that Celtic fans will see the transparency in their attempts to overturn their attitudes. They, they look at us as a big crowd who'll just go... Oh, 
that's Turnbull on our social media. <clears throat> and and fine, and the phrase hard work being used constantly in, in contrast to the pictures we saw earlier in the week. So from the Lenin situation, from the Dubai situation, from all the statements we've had throughout the season, they have looked like very thinly and poorly developed attempts to sway the Celtic support's mindset because they undervalue actually how much we're able to evaluate what they put out to us and that, that we can actually see through attempts that they are making to cover their tracks or, or 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 sweeten up a situation that isn't as sweet as it could be. So I, I the, the whole thing just frustrates me because I think it's all just indicative of a club who has, has no sort of forward going plan and, and thinks that they can get by with the minimum of effort. No, you're right. Yeah. Now, Jim mentioned Ed, Eduard. Forgotten again, Paul. If they're just doing things right, it's, it's making good decisions. And if if we don't win football matches, fine, because you you, you, know, you win some and you lose some. If we don't win leagues and we don't win cups, fine. But make good decisions. We'll see where that takes us. But see, when you make bad decisions, then you leave yourself wide open to criticism, and you deserve it if you make bad decisions. And if you keep on making bad decisions. As, as the management team have done this season in terms of the performances of the team, then you deserve criticism. So it's not a case of being entitled and wanting to chase buses in a car park and give it a slap. That's not what it's about. It's about making good decisions. And what we have seen, and that's the point Kevin was making, is nine years worth of bad decisions. But you know what? Because we're the biggest team in the country, we've won the league. Because we're the biggest team in the country. And what's happened in the past two or three years is we've had a challenger. And that's exposed the fact that maybe we're not that clever at all and we've been exposed and we should be embarrassed about what's happened this season. And if we do lose the league, as I said, hats off to the other team that's won the league because they'll deserve it. But part of the reason that they've won it is because we've shot ourselves in the foot by making bad decisions. Well, interestingly enough, talking about the, the team that, win in the, that wins the league uh, being deserving of that, I asked a question yesterday in relation to Rangers' form compared to Celtic's form in the Invincible season. And someone did come back to me to say that, you know, Rangers are only two points behind where Celtic were at that stage of the season during the Invincible treble year. So it is excellent form. So I take your point, Jim, even if we were firing on all cylinders, it would be a neck and neck title race at this stage. The frustration is we're so far away from that, so far removed from that neck and neck title race. You mentioned Eddie before, and I've seen a lot of people saying, you know, a, a massive mitigating factor in Celtic's um, demise this season has been um, certain elements that are out of our hands, Jim, like COVID casualties, like injuries. But in doing that, in the conversation we had around that point, you and I, were, was that uh, some of these international games shouldn't have been played, some of the European football, if not all of it, should have been put on hold. Yet, going back to your point, we have, you know, we've been pretty hypocritical then when we fly our entire team out to Dubai uh, on a break. So I, I, I've i heard everybody's views on it. It's going to be difficult for anyone to change my view uh, simply because we have put the team at risk Jim and all credit to you earlier in the season when you stuck your neck on the line and says Europe doesn't matter this season you were criticised when you said it you want to put out all your efforts and all your focus on Celtic winning the league and anything that puts that at risk should be sidelined it should be put to the side yet Again, we potentially put that at risk by going to Dubai. Thankfully, as far as I'm aware, we have had no casualties for Monday night's game, and we will speak about Monday night's game. But going back to the Eddie question, Laura, we're in the transfer window now. Um, a few weeks ago, Stephen Mullen read out a, a whole host of players that we'd signed during a January transfer window. Yeah. And it, it led you to believe that it's, it's not a particularly good month for Celtic to sign players. Now, what I thought... Um, is let's look really over the last couple of years. Look at the players that were brought in. Patrick Klamala, Ismail Osoro, Marian Sved, Manny Perez, Andrew Gutman, Vakun Bayo, Oli Burke, Timo Weir, Jeremy Tolian. So if Celtic supporters, and me included, are looking for January to try and um, you know improve the squad, to try and improve the season, looking at that list of players over the last couple of seasons, it's unlikely because very, very few of them have been successes over the last two years. Yeah, but another common thread there is 
had Sorrow not been given the chance he's been given in the last few weeks, he would have been considered a failure on that list as well. Mm-hmm. But he got his chance. So many of those other players that you're talking about, I- I'd be surprised. Manny Perez, for example, has he even pulled on a shirt for a first team game? I don't think that he has, to my knowledge. No. So it's it's one of these situations where, yes, maybe this calibre of player that is coming in in January is not of a high enough standard, but they're also not getting a fair shot at it, regardless of what they train or what they tend to didn't get their shot. Sorrow has proved that you can be, there can be all sorts of reasons why you've not been selected, but when you get your chance, you take it. Um, Bio is another one who I was left scratching my head at, at why he didn't seem to to get more of a run in the team because I didn't think he was awful. I didn't think he was absolutely the worst striker we've ever seen. He was no Chris Killen or Mo Bangura, you know what I mean? He's like, he was he was fairly decent had he been given a chance to get in the team and get a run. Um, so as much as there's a chance of um, bringing in poor quality, I think the other point is if you're going to bring them in at all, you need to give them a shot. And, and especially going into the second half of this season where essentially we have nothing very much to play for. So we don't have anything to lose by giving people a shot. The other way of looking at it is with the current global situation in terms of Brexit and, and everything else that's going on, the chances of us signing anybody from the EU are slim to none, I would guess. The chances of players wanting to come to Britain from, from overseas, given the current uh, pandemic situation, it is slim to none. So I would say this is a perfect opportunity for us to um, to look to the academy, to look to the younger players who are on the fringes of the squad and, and see if this next six months can be a chance for them to get a run and potentially cement a place for next season. That, to me seems to be the best way to go forward rather than just throwing more money down the toilet. There was another another name mentioned again, and we've had some feedback on the comments sections coming through. Patrick Murphy, who is regularly the first person to comment on these broadcasts. Patrick, welcome back. Benkovic is a good defender. We are, of course, talking about Philip Benkovic, the Croat, who has been at Leicester now for a number of years. He came to Celtic on a loan deal, played 27 games, was hampered by injury to some degree, has since then had uh, loan deals at Bristol City and Cardiff, uh, not played many games. He is a good defender, but injuries seem to be an issue. I take him back. If there is any clause that would allow us to terminate Duffy's loan, we should do it. He simply can't handle Celtic. Now, David Bradley disagrees. He reckons far too many injuries for Philip Benkovic. And then we do get other people uh, coming on. OB boy, why is there even talk of going back for Benkovic? He is injury prone. He goes on to say, go forward, not back. He's one of the names, he keeps cropping up, a bit like Foster, a bit like Paddy Roberts. Uh, Jim, or obviously the reason that that story broke was that Brennan Rogers was asked a question. Um, he described Celtic as a huge club. Um, uh, but he admitted that we haven't had any contact in relation to Philip Benkovic and he did say that Celtic would be a great move for him now you know we do have an issue at centre half Duffy's been mentioned already in the comments section he hasn't found his form he still doesn't look fit Big Julian's injured do we go to the, the youth do we go to some players who maybe are deserving of more of a a chance like uh, Welsh who's come into the side or do we dip back into the market and try and bring in someone like Philip Benkovic? Hey, I'm going to echo Laura's comments again today that uh, the fact that we haven't used people in the squad who are obviously good enough to play is another major contributory factor to this season. The Soros and the Turnbulls and I think there's other players we could have utilised. Luke O'Connell looks really good in that Cammy we came on against Hibs for the second half in that game before the season starts. He's a really good player. And Bailey's a good player, we think. So they don't have a, if you've got somebody in the first team squad, then my understanding would be is they should be good enough to play in the team. But we've got mm-hmm. a whole bunch of players that never get near the team. In terms of what happens in the January window, I'll go back to what's the strategy? What do we expect in this window? Are we still going for the league? It's unlikely. Are we planning for next year? Benkovic for this year, forget it. He's hardly kicked a ball in two years. He's not match fit, so it's going to take him what four, five, six weeks up to speed. So that could be a signing for next year. 
But for me, in my opinion, it's just about opinion, not for this year. If it's about trying to win the league, not Benkovic. It's somebody else who can get into that team. Not Benkovic for me. What what has what has Stephen Welsh done wrong to not yeah. to not merit a, a longer run in the team? Yes, he's a young player. He's slightly naive. He's 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 got things to learn. We've said it before about other players. The only way he's going to learn is by getting the opportunities in the team. He's almost ready made for this opportunity, and and I don't see any reason to go out like you say and and spend money on a two million loan signing like Duffy that doesn't yeah. work out or Benkovic who we've we know spends a lot of time on the bench at the best of times. Stephen Welsh must be sitting there thinking, give me my shot. I can I can prove myself worthy of a, of a shot here. He's certainly capable to play against your St Mirrens and Hamiltons and, and Kilmarnock's of this world. I, I, and given the fact that we're now at Europe, he's not going to be pressed by much higher quality than that. You know, it's a good point because I go back to the Connor Hazard situation, Laura. You and I watched the, the cup final, obviously, on that day that we clinched the quadruple treble. Uh, people were critical of some of the aspects of his play that day, but he contributed to that win as much as anyone during the penalty shootout. Uh, however, a couple of weeks later, he's out the side. Neil Lennon comes out and says, you know, Barkas is our first choice. That's why we signed him to be the first choice goalie. So what does that say to the, the younger players like Hazard, who's, who has broken in, who's made a, you know, given a good account of himself over the piece and he's just dropped, you know, but because we've signed this guy who was a costly signing uh, from AEK Athens earlier on. And, Jim, and do you want to come in? And everybody is pointing out about the fact that he's 22 years old and he's young and he's... Uh, you've made the point before. Sorrow is 22 years old. Nobody's talking about his age. At the end of the day, 22 years old at the best of times is not a young time to be put into a team. If he's good enough, and I think he is, bearing in mind he needs to improve a little bit with experience, then then put him in. Sorry, Jim, I jumped ahead of you there. No, no, I was just going to say the goalkeeping situation just sums up the season for me. Mm. There's no plan or no strategy there. Last time I was on was just before the cup final. And uh, I couldn't understand why Hazard was still in goals after the real game. I thought, you bring the guy in, you give him a game, you take him aside, you say, you've done well, son. You'll be on the bench from now on this season. We'll get you some more minutes. And Hazard would have been happy with that. Perfectly happy. But he plays him the next game. And then the next game. I mean, by the way, he was awful in the cup final. I mean, we were two penalty kicks away from one of the most embarrassing cup final defeats in the history of the club. Mm. Two, two penalty kicks. To have lost to a, a team in the league below us after being two goals up. That would have been worse than the Wraith Rovers game in 94. We were two penalty kicks away from, from disaster. But the guy did well by saving two penalty kicks. But in terms of the goalkeeping, he then keeps him in, he keeps him in, and he's two, or was it three clean sheets? And then he brings yeah. back Barkas, and then he says, because we've paid all this money for him. Again, you need to watch the words that you say. You know, because that's just like saying, because I've paid a lot of money, he has to come back. Mm -hmm. I think Barkas should have been all season, apart from when he's injured, because he's the number one goalkeeper. And the point, Laura, makes it unless you play people for maybe five, six, seven games, and get their confidence up, then they'll always struggle. So yeah, but to be fair to, to to be fair to Neil Lennon in that case, I think he was very careful about the words that he used. I think we've we've discussed potentially what's happened there. I think he's maybe decided I'm going to make the point that the reason I'm putting him in is because we paid all this money for him and we wanted him to be number one. I'm deliberately not going to say he's put in the performances that merit the chance. Because as we've discussed uh, last week, there's potentially other people involved in that decision. And so he's choosing his words to say, no, I'm not saying that he's been a player that's worthy of his shot, but but we're putting him in because of circumstances of how he came into the club. No, that's I interesting. I think it's very interesting because, again, what I would, the point I would make about is what's the plan and what's the strategy. The Gordon Strachan interview the other day talking about it's, it's the manager that picks the players. Yeah. Here's a question for you, Paul, because you're, you're far closer to the things than, than those ordinary pundits or ordinary punters. Uh, why do we let uh, the other goalkeeper go at the start of the season when his contract was up for renewal? Why do, we, Gordon. Let Gordon why do we let him go? Well, let the him go? In, well, we let him go, as far as I'm aware, because we thought the Fraser Foster deal was done. 
So we let, ha- we let uh, Craig Gordon go. Now, at the time, there was uh, a rumour suggesting that uh, we offered him a one-year deal. He took uh, he wanted a three-year deal. What I can say is what he got at Hearts is what he was offered at Celtic. So it, it didn't come down to the monetary value of the deal that we were putting together. Celtic made it quite clear to Craig Gordon that we, didn't, we don't want you at the club. We've got Fraser Foster coming in. That all collapsed. And obviously, we've gone okay. to the contingency. Okay. And the point I made every single week I've been on this don't do anything that puts the ten at risk. Right? At that point in time, we could have quite easily paid him a bit more if we'd have felt like it. Mm-hmm. But somebody made a decision, not the manager, we don't want to do this. And at that point in time, we didn't have Foster. Foster went back to his own club. He was going to be playing in the EPL because their season wasn't finished. And there was no guarantee we were going to get him. And again, just just as it's just my my feelings on this, I'd have been more than happy with Craig Gordon playing this season. And my gut feel is that most other Celtic fans would have been happy with Craig Gordon playing. So for the sake of another what million pound or something like that, we take a huge risk. We take a huge mm-hmm. gamble. We mm-hmm. took the gamble. What's happened since then? So say we to pay Craig Gordon another million pounds, say I've got no idea what the number is. What were the consequences of that? Consequence of that is we won't see another goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's okay, by the way. Right? How much do we pay him a year? And we pay a transfer fee of four and a half million pounds. And he's not as good as the guy we let go. So that's a terrible decision. And you stand or fall by decisions that you make. Who made mm-hmm. that decision? That was a terrible decision. Not in hindsight. Because what I was saying back in back in April before I was sharing my opinions with more than two or three people was that see if we can keep this squad together. For this season, I'd be happy with that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wasn't that bothered about bringing anyone in. Keep everyone in the squad, even guys like Anthony Ralston and people like that, because they've been in and around the, the squad. They're there every day. They're part of a team that have won nine in a row. We we'll let a goalkeeper go who is one of the main parts of the invincible season. He's given us six years, I think it's five or six years. You know, he's a top, top class goalkeeper, and we let him go when we didn't know we'd have somebody else better than him. I think that's a shocking decision. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's cost us, it's actually cost us on the field and it's cost us financially. Because we've ended up by not paying him an extra million pounds, maybe paying four or five million pounds extra when you talk about transfer fees and wages. So it's hit us on the football field and it's hit us financially. Another one I was going to ask you was about Jozo. What happened to him? Well that that's a massive um you know, that, that's a massive quandary for me because, again, he is still without a club, Jim. Still without a club. Yeah. And um, it was one of these ones whereby, again, going back to the, the Benkovic one, Neil Lennon told him he wanted to keep him for another season, but uh, he wasn't kept for another season, Jim. So the point you're making is these decisions are being made by a collective, but let, let's be honest, they've been made by Peter Lowell. That, that's what it comes down to. So... In the past, we've seen it with Samaras. The manager wanted to keep Samaras, he was let go. The manager made it clear he wanted to keep Mikhail Lustig, he was let go. Simunovic, I can't say for sure uh, if Lenny wanted to keep him, but he certainly wanted to keep Benkovic for another season as well. Was there not something in the social media that said that Neil Lem was given the choice of Beaton or Simunovic? Pick one of those two. Is that something that's... It sounds plausible. I think it sounds plausible. I've not heard that, Jim. It sounds plausible because you know how much Neil Lennon favours near Beaton. He, you know, he, he does seem to favour him if he's, if he's fit and we're looking for a defender. Near Beaton gets picked ahead of Shane Duffy, who's cost the club a lot of money, therefore contradicting the point about Barkas coming in, he's cost us all this money he needs to play. Shane Duffy's cost us all this money, but I'll sit him on the bench and play near, near Beaton out of position. Because... The thing about Semenovic, I think, and, and again, I can't see the comments, but I'm sure a lot of people will be thinking, don't be sad off. You know, you don't want him anywhere near Celtic Park. I looked at the stats for the past four seasons, and Semenovic has played something an average of 30 odd, 31 games a season. Mm. Compared to near Beaton, he's played about 40% more minutes on the park than near Beaton, if that was an issue. And that was him being out for half a season last year with a really bad injury, Semenovic. So he's yeah. been an integral part of the quadruple treble. And he's a decent centre half, and he's a centre half that's a no nonsense centre half. He just puts his head on the ball. And we thought we can dispense with his services. And my understanding was he had another year of his contract left. 
and we let him go. And he'd have been happy to sign. You know, mm-hmm. five grand, ten grand a week. But we let somebody let him go. And then a few weeks later, we play Kilmarnock at Rugby Park. And Julian and Ayer have a nightmare. And we say, you know mm-hmm. what? We need a decent centre-half. A no-nonsense centre-half that just puts his head on the ball. Like Siminovic? Oh, yeah, somebody like him. We go and get Shane Duffy, who's been an unmitigated disaster. And we're paying, what is it, 50 grand a week or something? Two and a half million pound a year. And we could have got Siminovic for 400 grand a year, 500 grand. Who made that decision? And that's my point that I'm trying to make today. Somebody's making decisions that have undermined the 10 before the 10 even started. We lose Craig Gordon. We lose Joe Zoe. Johnny Hayes is another one. Why do we just keep him for a few hundred grand to try and safeguard the 10? And you look at those decisions now. Awful. Absolutely awful for a few hundred grand. And look what we've spent since. Look at the silly money we've spent. And you and I, and I'm sure Laura, must have thought, this is a great transfer window. Look at how much we've spent. Look at the players we've brought in. Look at the big wages we're paying. But there's three decisions before it even started. Gordon, Siminovich, and Hayes. And I'm not saying they're world beaters. Of course not. But they'd have made a contribution to this season. We wouldn't have needed a new goalkeeper. We wouldn't have needed a new centre-half. No, you're right. The, the big thing as well, I, I see so many contradictions in what we've done because I, I made the point there about, um, you know, we are playing a, a goalkeeper because of the fee that we've actually paid, yet we're, we're not playing Shane Duffy and he's very, very expensive. We allow Jozo Simunovic to go, Jim, at the time where he's 25 years of age and he has a sell-on value. I'm not saying he's worth as much as we paid for him, but he has a sell-on value and we let him go. We make nothing from that that player who I think we, we probably spent about four and a half million quid on at the time. And I know that he's got bad, bad knees, but at 25, Jim, we've allowed a centre-half to go away and that has been a, a problem area has has the goalkeeper for the entire season so it's a, it's a great point just pick up that point about the bad knees right he played 91 games over three seasons they are two games game a season and last season he had a bad injury he was out for the four or five months mm. that was that well, the, the perception that he's a kind of you know he's he gets he gets lots of injuries the facts don't bear that out maybe when he first came but in terms of who's contributed to the quadruple treble uh, sorry, the quadruple uh, He's right in there. Mm. We let him go. Yeah. And we must have paid up his contract. His contract wasn't due up until the end of this season. So we, so, so, so to add insult to injury, you pay the guy's contract up and you let him go, and then you sign Shane Duffy two and a half million pound a year. Mm. Who did yeah, that? I think there's a, I think there's a difference between saying I don't think this person's worth a new contract, so we'll let it run down and we'll let it run out and making what appears to be an active decision to say, no, we don't want you anymore, you're out. And I think yeah. uh, if that's been the case with Simunovic, that's that's been a big mistake. On two levels, on a financial level, it just, why would you work that way? You would you would want to try and get, a, get some money back for it. And if you don't think you're going to get money back for it, then why not keep them? You're going to lose that money anyway by paying him, so you may as well keep him in the squad and use him when, if and when you need him over the next year, rather than just Absolutely. pay out a big lump sum of the same amount of money um, yeah. and, and then be, leave yourself a body short, regardless of how good or bad you think he actually is. Another point you make there in relation to Simunovic and his fitness, uh, Julien, the £7 million man's barely been fit this season, you know, so there's the irony in, in all of that. It's a £7 million guy has been on the treatment table for the best part of the season and he's back on there just now and out for another three to four months. Now, the reason I'm bringing up Stephen James's comment, uh, welcome back to the show, Stephen, on Twitter. If the Lennon if Lennon gets the transfer funds this month, does this mean no new manager? Well, you know, it really just feeds into the conversation we're having because Gordon Strachan explained how transfers work. Although he says the manager has the final say, Jim, the players aren't being identified. They're not being presented uh, by the manager. They're being presented to him um, and identified for him largely. There are examples, of course, when that's not the case. You know, Brendan Rodgers definitely wanted John McGinn. Um, and there's been, you know, in the past, Neil Lennon identified and wanted Gary Hooper because he had a, a situation there where his old agent also did a bit of scouting for him, Jim Melrose, and he was a big fan of Gary Hooper and they identified it um, as a team and they went for that player and I think he was a, a successful signing. But the way Celtic do it just now, 
we could still sign players in January the way that this is set up because it doesn't really depend on whether or not the manager wants a player. So, Laura, I've said that I expect us to go out and buy two or three loan players because we really do need to strengthen in certain areas in the park. Um, do you think we will go out and maybe bring... I know that one of our so-called targets, Mark McKenzie, has already moved from Philadelphia Union to Genk. So we're at that stage where players who we might fancy are on their move, they're on the move already. Mm-hmm. I think um, to, to go back to, to, get back to Stephen's point, um, the... The assumption would be if you are going to give Neil Lennon money in January, then you would have to suggest that the plan is to keep him in place for potentially a longer period of time. But it goes back to Jim's point earlier of that is how clubs normally work. But we're assuming there that there's a cohesive plan in place that suggests, well, if we are keeping this manager, he needs the funds. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if the way things are going at the moment, they're just saying, well, we're not getting rid of him. We need players in January, so we'll just let him decide who the players are, regardless of what the situation is going forward. And that creates two issues. One, obviously, the signings in January that Lennon's made in years gone by, we've gone over, have not been fantastic, whether it's him or or the club that are making those decisions. The other problem being, if you're a player coming in January and there's any sort of uncertainty about who the manager's going to be at the end of the season, you're probably scratching your head and thinking, do I want to go there? Because what if the next manager comes in and doesn't fancy me? Um, But the certainty is that we do need signings. I I, I just fail to see whether it will indicate what Neil Lennon's future is at the club. I would definitely like us to to bring in another defender if we possibly move Shane Duffy on for both his and Celtic's sake that would be great even though it's a waste of two million pounds but you know a defender is an absolute certainty I would like to say another striker but again how many failed strikers do we need to sign we have enough in terms of bodies it's just that we don't trust most of the ones that are there Mm -hmm. Um, I think probably what we need is if we're not going to be able to rely on Scott Brown as consistently as we have done in years gone by we certainly need another sort of sorrow type player uh, defensive midfielder just in case he experiences any issues because if he was to get down go down injured tomorrow you can't you're at the stage with Scott Brown where you can't really rely on him to do 90 minutes at the moment so I I would want to make sure there was somebody else appropriate in place of him um, so that would be my two major things is probably a central defender of some description and, and certainly a central defensive midfielder. Now, Jim, obviously we've already discussed the issues around us failing to give youth a chance. Um, earlier on in the week, I spoke to Colin Watt about yet another proposal um, for Celtic Colts to be admitted into the pyramids of Scottish football. We're not developing players enough, but when we do get the opportunity, we, we still don't uh, give them a chance in the first team. Do you see this as an opportunity? I mean, there's there's a tough month ahead in terms of fixtures for Rangers. And I asked Colin the question yesterday, you, when you look at the Rangers fixtures, um, we've got Aberdeen away, Motherwell away, Ross County at home and Hibs away. Would you expect them to drop anything from those four fixtures? And then similarly, looking at the Celtic fixtures, Hibs at home, Livingston at home, then away, and then Hamilton at home. Do you think we, in the the remaining four fixtures of January, uh, will claw anything back? Colin says no. He reckons there will be eight wins for Celtic and Rangers in those four in, in those four fixtures. What's your thoughts on that? Well, just before we go into the football matches, we've got a squad of twenty nine players. Okay, maybe two or three injured just now. What a shocking indictment that is of those twenty nine players. Of course, they need to sign more players. We've got enough players there. Let's give them a chance. Again, I think we're in limbo. We don't know if the manager's going to be there after the summer. We don't know if the chief executive is going to be there after the summer. So who decides who signs who? It's a shambles. In terms of the games, they won't drop any points. And the chances are we're now starting to play a bit better. So we shouldn't be dropping any points either. Uh, obviously, it's still mathematically or arithmetically possible to win the league. But if we were in their shoes, we'd be saying the league's done. The league's done and dusted. It's a matter of when of what day will we win the league. And the, the thing I just thought that, that occurred to me last week while watching the game, uh, only two of their players weren't there last March. They've got essentially the same team they had. Mm. It fell apart. 
it's because they've been coached properly and they looked hard to beat. And we've got, I think we do have better players. I think we do have a better squad, but we haven't been coached properly. And that's another reason we're in, or that's the main reason we're in the situation that we're in just now. And I wouldn't write off some of the players we have because I think under a different coach, I think they'd be better players. But to answer the question that you've asked, they won't drop any points because one of the other things about this season is the standard of other teams. It's really poor. And I think a lot of these teams have had to cut their cloth because of the pandemic mm-hmm. as well. And we don't parts in the league because uh, I was offered hearts remaining in the top tier because if there, was, if there was ever a team that was going to take a points off the main challengers, it was Hearts. Because what happened last year was Hearts took took five points off them. We were we were thirteen points ahead when the, when they get stopped. Five of them were down to Hearts. I kept Hearts from the team. I just think the quality of teams in the league is really really poor. Uh, so I, I can't see who would who would who would take points off them. Aberdeen away, yeah, Hibs away, but even those two teams aren't having a particularly good season. So you know I would. Agree with Colin. Yeah, nothing's going to change over the next month or so. I'm dead interested, as as, as anyone is, is what's going to happen at Celtic Park because mm. it's limbo. It's just clueless. There's no strategy, as I said before. And whatever we do, do uh, I've got no idea why we're doing it because I just don't understand what's happening. And it's a shocking situation to be in. If we'd have changed the manager two or three months ago, you'd have said, "Well, give the manager funds for next season. There'd be some sort of plan there." That's not happened. So we've got two dead men walking almost. Mm-hmm. And we're going to give them money to sign players. That, you know, it's just it's just a shambles. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It has turned it has turned into a, a complete shambles. And I say turns, I mean it, the signs have been there for most of the season. Um if I was to be the most positive man on the planet, I would be looking at this this uh, journey to Dubai positively and saying, you know, it might well be good for the team bonding, it might well be good for the fitness. Um, Laura, I'm going to ask you, we were in a, a good run of form leading into the, the Rangers game. Uh, the biggest part of that, the shining light was Sorrow and Turnbull, you know, part of this diamond that was working well. We also had the two up front and we've gone into the Rangers game. I think we performed pretty well for the most part of that game, but we weren't able to manage it after the sending off, unfortunately. And then we've gone away for the break. Do you think that Celtic will still be um, in a good run of form when we when we return on Monday night? I mean, I would hope so. Um, There's two ways to look at the Rangers' defeat. One is, you know, in some ways it was a bit of a kick in the teeth. You know, they didn't have a shot on target. We played so well but didn't take our chances and then they end up um, winning by an own goal. Um, In other circumstances, if we'd had to go straight into a following match... I think that might have knocked our confidence more and we kind of maybe would have been still rocking from that defeat. The one thing that, that you know, this break might have provided for all the criticisms it's attracted is a, a chance for the players to kind of put that defeat behind them uh, and try and remember the form that they were in going into the game and come back into um come back into the league a bit more fired up and raring to go. I have to say, I, I, there are a lot of other teams in the league I would rather be playing than Hibs uh, for the first game after the Rangers game, but, you know, they're about as much of a test as we're going to get in the league, so so what better chance to, to show kind of that we are still on form and that we are still taking things forward. Um, I expect a strong performance. You can bet your bottom dollar if we come out looking tired, if we come out looking... Uh, in any way uh, not up to scratch, the first thing that's going to be mentioned is, well, why did you fly halfway around the world uh, when there wasn't a winter break? So they, for the good of themselves and the good of their reputations, they better come back and, and, and perform in a way that suggests that the, that the training camp was, was worth it. No, you're right. Also, Terry Hibbs, Tibbs. Also, Hibbs, sorry, Paul. Also, Hibbs just lost to nothing to Livingston. And mm-hmm. that's my point about the standard of teams. So we're playing a team who just lost to nothing to Livingston. Mm-hmm. No, you're right. And um, managed by Jack Ross, of course, who has been linked to the Celtic job, most notably by Kevin Graham. Now, Terry Tibbs uh, is coming on to say fitness is an issue. It's something I have brought up. And um, we were looking at the game that you and I watched uh, live, Laura. Well, I say live, remotely live. Uh, and we looked 
as we were going to win 3 or 4 nothing against Hearts we're sitting there at half time first half performance was very very good and all season we've been saying you know Celtic played well for 30 minutes against this team they played well for 45 for 60 but very rarely have we actually put in a 90 minute performance I had a look at the goals conceded um, you know very rudimentary kind of stats and tactics and all this kind of stuff is my forte none of the, the real analytics but we have lost 15 goals in the last 20 minutes of games this season 15 of 41 goals have been lost in the last 20 minutes do you feel going back to the point Jim raised earlier about the culture that I keep going on about that that has resulted in Celtic losing that um, fitness because we were always we were always famed for being the team that scored in the last five minutes yeah you, you only need to look at one player um, to sort of have a kind of microcosm of an example of the difference between the current culture and the current fitness levels of the team in the Neil Lennon era compared to the Brendan Rodgers era, and that's Scott Brown. When when Brendan Rodgers came in, Scott Brown changed as a player. I, I think I remember him saying he hadn't felt fitter in his career, he hadn't worked as hard, he hadn't felt as fresh as he did under Brendan Rodgers. And that has declined as quickly as it arrived since since Brendan Rodgers left. That is something that you're seeing widespread across the team. And statistics, you know, people can people can make their judgments on how valuable statistics are. But there's only one reason you can see. Well, two reasons you can see goals late in games. Two the two reasons are a fitness and b concentration. Those are those must be at a lower level than they are. You know, we talked about, um, we got into a bit of a heated debate with Lawrence at the cup final because he was suggesting that there's nothing else Neil Lennon can do from the, the sideline in the last five minutes of the game. Brendan Rodgers never let up on his players for the full 90 minutes. So we were never in danger of losing concentration or, or taking our foot off the pedal in the last 15 minutes of the game. That's something that this team definitely suffers from, A, because of, I think, an apparent lack of fitness that is just there to see for everybody, and B, uh, a lack of concentration that is not recognised or dealt with by the team on the sidelines. Jim, what's your thoughts been uh, around the point that we've made? You know, it's been brought up time and time again about us not putting in a good ninety-minute performance. Some of the the performances in Europe has has been at proper Jekyll and Hyde performances. We've taken a, a goal lead and then we've collapsed, and that's happened regularly this season. See, you've got no shape, structure, organisation, or tactics, and you depend on individual players. Then you're always going to suffer. And that's what we've had this season. We lose a goal and we'll panic because we don't have that structure. We don't know what we're doing. And I didn't say too much about the game last Saturday, but the goal they scored for me, again, summed up the season. We lost another goal to a set piece. And a lot of the goals that you were talking about have been lost to set pieces. Mm -hmm. If you analyse that corner kick, what happened at the corner kick? Well, a few things happened at the corner kick. If we're losing lots of goals from corner kicks, would you not think we'll put a guy on each post just to be safe because we keep losing goals from, from corner kicks? No, nah, we didn't do that. We put Eddie on the front post and nobody on the back post. Frimpong is marking Joe Aribo, who's about 10 feet taller than him. And he's the guy that gets a head on. Eddie's on the front post. And when the corner gets taken, Eddie moves off the front post. So Barkas is thinking, I don't want to get beat my front post. And he moves to the front post, creating a massive gap at the other post. And then bang, bang, and we've, and we've lost a goal. Where's the discipline there? Mm. Where's the organisation mm. there? It's non-existent. And if one or two of those things had been done, we wouldn't have lost that goal. And we've been losing lots of goals like that. And what tends to happen in the games is when we lose a goal, we panic. And what happened in the cup final, for me, it was an exact replica of the semi-final. We played really well in the first half, scored two really good goals, and then Aberdeen pushed us back in the second half, and they made chances. The only difference was they didn't score. And we ended up winning the game. Hart scored, and panic set in, because there was no shape and no structure and nothing to it. And that's why I think maybe these players under a different coach I think would be significantly better. The issue is the manager, and I think what I've said in, in the podcast in the past, I wasn't for getting rid of the manager right away, or after Ferris Bars, or after Rangers, or after Aberdeen. After Hibs, I thought, yeah, it's a lot of time to go. And I thought that would have been fair. 
I'm not a fan of the manager, but I just think it would have been half to get rid of him before that. Not taking that decision, and you stand and fall by decisions, has left us where we are just now, where it's out of sight. A new manager coming in, we might have won that game last half of it, because maybe people to do the right things on the park. And the fitness thing, uh, we've had so many games this season, we've been okay in the first half. And then the second half, we've been, we've, been, we've, been, we've been poor. And what I've noticed in some of the games, I remember watching the Hibs game. Uh, I know Jack Ross has been talked about, but I don't think Jack Ross should be anywhere near Celtic. But he's a good manager. I think he's a better manager than the one we've got. I don't think he's somebody for Celtic. But what he saw after the first half, he thought, they've got nothing to offer. And they pushed off about 10, 20 yards in the second half. And all of a sudden, we were losing 2-0. And these are these are these are my and my my kind of bugbear is that managers who 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 get jobs without learning their trade are not as good as managers who learn their trade. Jack Ross went to Alloa, was it? I think it was Alloa. Yeah. Go yep. playing good football. And actually played really well. Went to St. Mirren, built a good team, got them up. Obviously we went to Sunderland, didn't watch it so well. And he's doing okay at Hibs. So I think there's no doubt in, in, in my mind that Jack Ross would be an upgrade. And the manager we've got just now, but I think we're looking for somebody a wee bit higher than that. But to answer the question again, our fitness levels, because of the way games have went, we need you to believe they're not as good as they should be. No, I would agree with that. I'm going to ask the both of you for a prediction on Monday night because I won't speak to you until Friday of next week. So, Laura, start with yourself Celtic versus Hibs at Celtic Park. First things first, I would really, really like us to keep a clean sheet. I think it's important to, to get back on that particular train. So um, I'm going to say in that case, I would like to see a 2-0. 2-0 I would be happy with. 2-0 Celtic. Jim? Once again, I'm going to, uh, to echo Laura's sentiment. I'm going for 2-0 as well. Right, well, here's hoping we are talking about a 2 nothing victory next week when we meet up again. If not, there could be even more twists and turns in this season of all seasons. Thank you, everybody, for getting involved on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. And all that's left for me to say is Laura Bradburn, Jim Moore, thank you for joining me once again on A Celtic State of Mind. <laughs>